Library Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet and from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And my name is Professor Mark Sheriff. And Will, I'm going to warn you right now, if for some reason during this podcast, my voice just starts cracking. I just finished reading a book to my daughter tonight in which the, the main character is a hamster. It's a lovely book, but I had to do the entire book in a hamster voice. And so if... <laughs> And the hamster voice coming like this? It, yes, and for, and for those of you... more in line with what we were thinking. Oh, that was, that's more of a helium voice, but, uh, yes, you know... I mean, um, hamsters have for small anyone, larynxes. There you go. For for anyone that enjoys the Betty G. Bernie books of, of Humphrey, I love, love, love Humphrey! And now my voice, I have a nice cup of, uh... Let's see, it cracked right there. I have a nice cup of peppermint tea... And I'm ready to start talking about things. Speaking of which, speaking of things coming in, we actually got some feedback Ooh. that we need to talk about here up front. Okay. First off, apparently my niece uh, has taken some umbrage with the uh, assertion that we, the, that the, uh, what was the animal from Minecraft that you said could not be tamed? What the, I, I was talking about how the ocelot can be tamed. Oh, the ocelot could be tamed. Okay, so she she was very adamant that 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 fish is what we needed in order to tame the ocelot. Yeah, I figured it was. I knew it wasn't bones because that's dogs. So I figured it was something like that. But uh, you know, it, it's been it's been a hot minute since I've played Minecraft. Uh, well, my my niece is is very much into it right now, and also from my father, who uh, was telling me he binged. All do of the episodes. Any, do we have any non nepotism feedback? I should note. No, 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 we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> well, okay. No, no, no. We have one comment on our on my YouTube channel where I've posted the the audio as videos. Right. And it was just this is fabulous. And so Centurion, if you're listening, who this is all I, for you. We do it all for you, Centurion. It, all, all for you, my friend. So uh, this is a response to the. How do you intentionally ruin a Zoom call? And of course, yeah. this is when we both talked about the, let's say, questionable bandwidth that our <laughs> our parents have at their mm -hmm. house. Uh, my father sent this quote in from the Reader's Digest uh, that was attributed to Will Ferrell, which is, before you marry a person, you should first make them use a computer with slow internet to see who they really are. Fair point. So it's good. So his, his good question... I, I would still be a bachelor. So... <laughs> So his question along those lines is, what would you consider to be slow internet? What would be the bandwidth that you would put that criteria at? Um, well, this is where we don't tend to measure slowness in a in a uh in a mechan or in a, in a numerical sense. Like it it really comes down to when I open up a web page. Does it load at a pace such that I don't have to sit there and wait for it to load? Uh, and for context, I mean, think back to the dial-up days. You know, you would see a picture load top to bottom, right? Like one mm -hmm. line at a time. Yeah. Because it would load mm -hmm. in every pixel. There's a great, um, you, you know the Futurama not sure if meme? Sure. Right? So it, it's Fry with the skeptical look, and the top of the image says not sure if loading, and half the picture is blank. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's, it's actually great because, I you know, I had slow internet enough, uh, especially from when I was, you know, in dorms or, you know, on cheaper internet when I was in grad school, that um, I got used to images loading in that way. So it, it kind of, when I see an image half loaded from the top, I think, oh, yeah, it's still loading just naturally. Um, but, you know, it depends. I mean, part of it, too, is what am I doing at that point? Um, you know, if streaming video needs to buffer for a bit, that doesn't tend to bother me too much. But being more a gamer, if I get a lot of lag in game, that does bother me. Um, so right. It, it all depends upon what the responsiveness that you need, what sort right. of lag that you are dealing with, because, you know, your average your average internet user is basically just doing email and web surfing as a primary. And then, you know, we can get streaming video and things like that in here in right. a second, but you know, we do as programmers, we do tricks, so to speak on mm -hmm. web pages to try and 
uh, speed up how things are downloaded. Mm-hmm. We, we do things like try to make it load the text first before it loads any images so that they're right. loading the background. We do things like put large libraries onto content delivery networks so that those are easily accessible and they're cached locally. So mm-hmm. you're not always downloading the same JavaScript library or something like that. So internet technology or, or more, more accurately website technology has improved significantly over the years from when we were using 56 K dial up mm-hmm. or we, when the, the huge argument, Oh God, how long ago was it when it was, do you do cable or do you do D- DSL? Right. And I remember th- those arguments for so, for so long. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, just today I was out running in my neighborhood and they're laying fiber right now. Oh, nice. So yeah. So, so yeah. The, the, the change is going to be dramatic. So yeah, my, my neighborhood is still, um, they're doing the survey for interest for that. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of fiber. <laughs> Do you want to have 1000 megabits up and down? Hmm. Let me think this. Yeah. Let me think yeah. this through. Well, that was our feedback, so thank you to... Thank you. To my father. Who, I, who I, said I he tried also, to... I, I will also say, uh, as it relates to slow internet, in gaming, the reason it matters is because the game keeps going, even if you can't play it because of lag. So contrary to, to every mother I've ever met, you cannot pause an online game. <laughs> uh, just, just putting that out there. Oh man, I've definitely had that that discussion plenty of times. And I, I I have a question banked up um, okay. in this general realm. Not today though, because I haven't I yeah. haven't finished my research into it to make sure it's ready. But I do have a question that we do have some research for, and it is also a callback to a previous episode. Will McBurney? Yes. How did the game genie work? So this so is this where is I have to chime in. Uh, while the Game Genie was out when I was a kid, for, for most of my gaming years, I was a little bit older. Uh, I used, uh, I, I played a lot of Game Boy Advance and Game Boy Color. Mm-hmm. It was Game Shark then. It not was. Game Genie. Yeah. But uh, was it the same company or just renamed? Or I actually don't know. Uh, that I don't know. Uh, I know that Galoob is the company that, that ended up publishing or producing the Game Genie in the U.S. market. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about the Game Shark, and I feel like there was another one specifically for PlayStation, uh, like a replay something. And I'm blanking on the name of that uh, one right now. Yeah, something like Action Replay or yeah, that, that sounds right. Yeah, I I, I remember that. Um, I remember that also, and it, it it they all broadly work in the same principle. Although you had to have a memory card with the PlayStation version, since you couldn't plug a disc into another disc. Whoa. Yeah. Discception. So for. Our younger listeners, all however many of you are, <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't know much to trust what uh, mm-hmm. Anchor tells me our our ever our uh, current listener base is. But for those that you don't know and you need a refresher about the Game Genie or similar technology, it was an accessory that you could purchase that you attached in between the video game system mm-hmm. and the cartridge that went into it. And yeah. so the Game Genie became very popular in the nineties. Uh, as a way of quote unquote cheating at the game mm-hmm. is what many would say. Although Galoob and their advertising would say it was a game enhancer. Oh yeah. And what's interesting it was just, is before it was enhancing we get to the, that I would never die. It it is. And actually, uh, before we get to the technical part, there was some really interesting uh, stuff that I found. This is this is from MentalFloss.com. I will put a link in the show notes. Um, but it talks about the lawsuit that Nintendo brought against Galoob. Mm -hmm. And they were claiming copyright violation. And the precedent that was set here was it was not actually creating a derivative work. This is why music Mm -hmm. sampling, if you sample the music and you made a new song that was a derivative work and that could be that could be a copyright violation. But here you had to have a Nintendo. Mm -hmm. You had to have the actual cartridge. It was just something that was input in the middle. It was literally enhancing. And so Mm -hmm. it was a it was not struck down. And that was a uh, pretty, pretty fascinating first step in uh, some video game technology law right there. So now for the good computer sciencey stuff. Yeah. As a kid, you know, this was magic, right? You mm-hmm. turned it on, the game genie screen would pop up. You'd have a little hand would... that like pointed at the letters, right? Uh-huh. Oh yeah. You had, to, that was cursor. That was the cursor yeah. back then. It was, it was actually and... like a hand and it had like a little like sleeve, like, collar thing like a poofy 
thing at the end of the sleeve a little bit. I remember this vaguely. It's apparently so. It's very important. The poofy yeah. sleeve thing. Yes. Yeah. And um, you would put in a code, a six six letter code typically, yeah. uh, and it would do something. And yeah. sometimes it was you never lost life. Sometimes it was infinite life. Sometimes it was skip to a level. It could be a mm. bunch of different things. And Galoob not only made money by selling the device, but also they sold books, the books that had all the codes in them. Yeah. That had all the codes in them. And yeah. the codes are literally still being found today. Oh yeah. Because the way the technology works. Mm -hmm. So do you want to take the you're gonna take the first stab at it or Yeah. So well I so I do know that uh in game development often and I and this is a wrong answer. I'm fully aware of it. But in game development a lot of times you will get uh for the sake of developers, you will have cheats in there. So, for example, in, in Sonic the Hedgehog 2, if you put if you go into the sound test and you pick five specific numbers in a row, it gives you a level select. And that's so that way they could test each level mm -hmm. at a system level more quickly than playing through the whole game. So, one possibility here is that these code the, the these cheats were already in the game and the game genie just let you found them. Now, I assume that's not correct. That, I, well, I, what's interesting is that certainly it, I think is actually you are correct in some instances. I think in mm -hmm. some some codes, you did bypass whatever wall was put up to get into a test like mode. Like some Boolean flag or something like that. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. that's probably the case. But what, what happens with uh, basically uh, all programming uh, a programming is basically just the manipulation of information and then displaying it on the screen in a unique and interesting way. It could be mm -hmm. Excel. It could be Word. It could be Mario Brothers. Doesn't really matter. But when you load up Mario Brothers, somewhere in memory, there is the number written down two. And that's how many extra lives Mario has right there. So think of it kind of like this. Mm -hmm. The cartridge has the set of instructions for how Mario works. And the Nintendo will ask the cartridge, hey, what's the next thing I need to do? And the mm -hmm. cartridge will effectively give it instructions. Right. And the, and the Nintendo has, a let, let's say, a filing cabinet. And mm -hmm. in that filing cabinet, there are drawers. Mm -hmm. And in a particular drawer, it put in, oh, two. Two goes in here that's and it closes that drawer right. and says, that's number lives. That's awesome. You run into the first Goomba because you don't remember how to jump. <laughs> it opens that drawer. The Nintendo cartridge, the says what a, you what need to loser, decrease the way, that number by the one. first Goomba. I know. Yeah. No, it's I I <laughs> 40 year old aging, gamer. What, aging what really say? takes it out of you. Anyway, good. Yeah. Uh, okay. I got to very quick side story. Whenever I teach video game development, I always make my students play Super Mario Brothers 3 from worlds one to five and they're not yeah. allowed to use any warps. Yeah. And going into the lab and watching them play on an original Nintendo and watching them fail over and over and over and over yeah. is one of the joys of my teaching career. <laughs> Because yeah. sh sh sheriff, sheriff, this is impossible. How could you possibly do it? give me the controller, kid? Give me the controller. Yeah. Do it. Say, like, how did you do that? I was like, I've been practicing this for twenty five years. You're fine, and, and your parents said that you were wasting your time. I know. I was uh. preparing for my career in education. So, <laughs> so what the game genie does is whenever the Nintendo, whenever you run into that Goomba. And the Nintendo says, hey, I need to update this value. What should I do? The Game G says, hey, Cartridge, what, what should happen here? And the Cartridge says, oh, decrease it by one. Game G says, okay, cool. And it says the Nintendo, just leave it alone. It's fine. It, it, it's 99. <laughs> yeah, it's 99. It's 99. It's, it's 99. Fine. Yeah, it's still 99. So all of these codes were a combination of two things. A memory location. So that would be the drawer where it stored that mm -hmm. variable number. And, and that specifically being on the Cartridge not on the console. That's relevant here. Yeah. Right. And how do you then change or not change that value mm -hmm. in, in a given scenario? Many codes, many, many codes, infinite codes would just crash the game because you'll change something. It's like, turn on game. No, and it's just dead. So people have been hunting for these codes literally for decades. Yeah. Because it's a matter of hunt and peck, needle in a haystack. Can you find mm -hmm. the right drawer? What's the code for changing the variable to do something interesting? Can I just change Mario's overalls color? That's stored there somewhere. Can mm -hmm. I find that? And so it's this really, really cool way of, of searching. Now, modern technology 
uh, with emulation. So again, legal, legally, you're not allowed to do this unless you own the cartridge. And even mm-hmm. then it's still kind of shady, but kind of a legal so gray could, area. Yeah. yeah, it is a little legal gray area. So you're playing super Mario brothers on your desktop on, mm-hmm. a, on a PC. You can possibly in Microsoft Excel. Possibly. <laughs> Just because we mentioned that earlier. Anyway, go ahead. So you can pause the game and then you can take a snapshot of what all of memory looks like mm-hmm. at that exact moment. Then you can step forward one little bit, run into that Goomba, and take the next snapshot changes. and see what changes. Yep. And so today it has gotten easier to find these codes mm-hmm. um, because we have that ability. And it's not the literal randomness that you were trying to do when dealing with the actual Nintendo itself. So the Game Genie is a fascinating little piece of enhancing technology. So how does the code, you... how, how does the code relate to this process then? So you, so put, that, in, that, you put in a six digit code. What, how does that code turn into, Hey, I have 99 lives. So that is a great question. And it's actually addressed a little bit in the, um, in the game genie article from mental floss. Um, the, the trick though was, is there were they felt there were legal reasons they could not use the actual hexadecimal values, okay. which would be zero through nine, A through F, which is how we would typically come up with a memory address mm-hmm. in in computer science terms. Um, they decided that they would translate those into something that was easier to basically tell other people. So just six character letters, and then it there's some internal algorithm they use to make that trans yeah, that some, translation some type so. of one to one hash. Right. So yeah. I don't have any more information on that from this article, but, but, but I'm presumably sure it gave a memory location and a value to put into that memory location. Yep. Yeah. Correct. So, so you were actually saying like you're basically replacing the memory. There were actually other games that had that go between architecture of mm-hmm. um so 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 the so the NES had a governor chip that made, or yep. that, that made sure that, hey, this is actually a Nintendo product you're putting in. But the thing is, people figured out what it was. And so there were mm-hmm. a lot of unlicensed games for the NES. The best Tetris version. Yeah. And so with, with Super Nintendo, they actually made it much more strict. There is one game on Super Nintendo that is notorious for having a bypass. It is Noah's Ooh. Ark 3D. Which is, by the way, Castle Wolfenstein... But with, you know, the German soldiers replaced by goats and the guns replaced by a slingshot. It actually, not a joke, is Castle Wolfenstein. I need to find this. So the, um, the way the game bypasses it is the cartridge is like a game genie. It plugs in and there is another cartridge port on top and you have to put in a Super Nintendo game. So <laughs> it, it, it literally bypasses it. Right. This is this is a Bible game, by the way. Right. So, um, like, so it's not like Sonic and Knuckles, where like you could put in so- Sonic the Hedgehog two and play Sonic the Hedgehog two as Knuckles. It's not right. that because it didn't matter what game you put in. You just had to put in a Super Nintendo game because they couldn't get their game licensed because they weren't willing to pay the fees. I I just <laughs> hope that people used Mortal Kombat because that would just be a perfect. <laughs> Yeah, there's, hey, there's actually Bible. a lot of there's a lot of conspiracy theories about how this company, which was notorious for making very cheap knockoff games, how it got their hands on the source for uh, Wolfen uh, for Wolfenstein or Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Hmm. Hmm. Wolfenstein 3D. Sorry, that's a different game. Anyway, oh man, those Bible games. Bible Adventures for NES was another infamous one that did not go through the Nintendo seal of yep. approval process. Yep. Well, it was that particular that. company had a lot of um, they 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 were involved in a lot of games that uh, that weren't religious as well that were just generally very very cheap knockoffs of other games. So, Wisdom Tree, I think, was the name of it. Anyway, anyway, all right. So I have a question. I can't wait. So, uh, Steam just had a, a a sort of a sale. Steam Next, where you could play a lot of demos mm-hmm. to play games. Um. Or, you know, for games that are coming out, put them on your wish list, etc. But they have coming up the Steam Summer Sale. How Oof. does the Steam Summer Sale make money? I mean, they're taking games that, like, like Dishonored, for example, sold for 60 bucks at launch. 
I bet during the Steam sale, you could buy it and all the DLC for like five bucks. How are they Probably. making money doing this? So that that's the question. How how are they having these sales that make so much money? Are they just stiffing the the game developers? You know, they're like we're just we're just going to keep this five dollars and you don't get any. What what is the process here whereby these games go on sale for so cheap? Sometimes you'll even see a game that was sixty dollars a year ago, brand new, now being like twenty dollars, or two years ago, sure. like ten dollars. How does this happen? There's a lot to dig into here yeah. um, between things like the percentage that the online stores take. I think Steam's take is about 12 percent. I think Epic, the Epic store takes less than that. Yeah, Epic also I think is, is 10. Yeah. But monetization of games is is dramatically changing with yeah. services like Xbox Game Pass and Apple Arcade. Mm -hmm. And there was even a, a dump recently from, I think think Apple Arcade with the price that they paid for all of for each individual game and then how many no it was Epic it was Epic it was not the yeah. Apple Store because Epic was giving away games if you signed up for um the Epic store, store yeah. within the first little bit and yeah, they, they, they were, people were still prohibitively using Steam for a long time yeah right so how are they still making money i mean games make their most money it, it, I, I hope you have an answer for this because this, this is my yeah. this is my inclination. Games make their most money within the first three months, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, the people who have done the, this is why pre-orders were such a big deal for yep. for a long time. They're still a thing, but they're not, not nearly the thing that they used to be when you would go into GameStop. But mm -hmm. um, they would make you'd make most of your money those first three months, and their goal at that point is effectively to recoup costs. Mm -hmm. At that point, once they've recouped costs, you have a property that you can then continually sell at some rate to make basically residuals in the kind of the same way that you would have a syndicated television show, except you're probably, I mean, it depends upon contracts and things like that. I'm guessing, um, but you're probably not, you know, paying residuals to individual. I mean, maybe you are to, to voice actors or things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's my guess. All right. Well, so let's, so first the, there's there's a little bit of um the way the human brain works kind of hasn't kept up with the digital marketplace because okay I love how I just went a, a dive into how it works and you went back let's talk about how your mind is wrong yeah well no 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 <laughs> I mean but no you were actually right for the note and and we'll we'll get into why you but specifically we we tend to equate going to going to you know GameStop and buying a game used with going on Steam and buying a game. And those are, you know, buying an older game, right? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we equate them because, well, both of them are at a discount, right? But they're they're very fundamentally different, both in terms of who's making the money, but also in terms of the actual cost. So if you're talking about a physical game disc, to sell that game, you have to print it on a physical disc, you have to ship it to a store, it has to take up shelf space in the store, the store has to pay for, you know, electricity, and they have to pay for staff that work there, right? And so all of those costs add up in the, in the physical store that ultimately eat into the profits of A, the publisher, B, the game seller, right? So this is why GameStop, they always push you to buy used games, not because they want you to you know, oh, you're, you're saving money, you're such a great, you know, we, we just really want to take care of our customers, but because when they buy a used game from someone, they then turn around and mark it up, you know, 3X or whatever, and they put it right back on the shelf and sell it, that is pure profit for them. They don't have to pay any mm -hmm. developer fees or, or, or whatever. So now, how does that relate to Steam? Well, the issue with Steam is there's no physical game to print, there's no shipping, right? There's just server traffic, and that's yeah, server that's costs. A, that's a lot cheaper than a truck, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, the server doesn't. The server probably doesn't. I want to say probably doesn't run on gasoline. There, there. I'm sure there are exceptions. <laughs> um, well, I, I I meant power plants, but okay. Anyway, <laughs> or or generators. I'm sure that was that. I'm sure that was a nice audio treat yeah. for our listeners too. So. Um, and so one aspect is even though Steam takes like 12% of the sales from a $60 sale, they still don't have to print the disc. They still don't have to ship it, right? They don't have to have this huge apparatus of figuring out where to ship how many games. 
And so, yeah, it, 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 it is much more profit, potentially. The other side of it is the marginal cost of producing each product is negligible. Mm -hmm. So if you want to print, you know, it's so like Red Dead Redemption 2 sells out really, really quickly, and they need to send out a bunch more game discs. They have to print all those discs. They have to load them back into trucks. They have to pay the truck driver and the gasoline to get the truck to the GameStop, right? The GameStop still has to pay the worker. That marginal cost is basically the same as the original cost in terms of the physical printing, not the development time, of course. Right, right, right. The what, Once a game is profitable, though, everything after that in digital sales, almost all of it is pure profit because there's so little cost associated relative to per unit cost. Uh, there's so little cost associated with, hey, here's the license number, send it to this user. Put this in their, you know, their Steam list of, of, of license tokens they have. And now they have access to this game. Right, that is, that is much cheaper. And so because there's no marginal cost, they could make money selling it much, much cheaper. Whereas if they wanted to print games and ship them to a store, you know, they can't, they can't say, oh yeah, here, this game that we re reprinted and put on everything and shipped to a store, yeah, that's $10. You can't do that because the marginal cost is, is higher. So part right. of that is in a digital marketplace, the cost of producing new product is higher. But there's also other incentives, and, I, and I, uh, there's going to be a link included with this release to a picture. Uh, this is from Quora, and this is actually from uh, uh, Gama Sutra, uh, which is... Gama is Sutra. Oh, yeah. Gama Sutra, which is much more safe to work for work than it sounds. Um, it, it, for those who don't know, it is, it is one of the premier game developer yeah. news sources. It's, it's great. It is. It is very good. And, and this... The, the the chart that will be included is a specific game called Defender's Quest, and this was an independent developer game. This wasn't some big developer, and it shows the number of sales they get, you know, at a given time. So it starts with early release, which is effectively a demo period. This was in early January of 2012, and you can see there's like three different spikes for when the game gets sold. And those are associated with news articles on Rock, Paper, Shotgun, on um, Congregate, you know, feature. And initially, it's a lot of direct sales. There's some sales on Congregate, which uh, gaming website. And then you get to launch. And it launches on Steam. So the early release was $7. It mm -hmm. launches on Steam for $15. So wait, you bought the game earlier for cheaper. Well, that's because the idea is in early release, you're a beta tester. More yep. or less. Um, you're paying for the privilege to do Q&A unpaid for a company. You're effectively an employee at that point. No. Um, <laughs> but from there, so Steam, the game launches, it sells uh, in total at $15. It makes about, and again, this is revenue, about $10,500. Which, you know, that's... That's less than a uh, thousand sales, not, but it's it's still respectable. And it was initially released at thirty three percent off, meaning it was actually mm -hmm. selling at ten dollars, not at fifteen dollars. As soon as that thirty three percent sale ends, sales drop off a cliff and it falls off. And the thing is, as Sheriff mentioned earlier, game sales drop off dramatically after the initial release window. But then eventually, uh, only about a month later, they have a 50% off sale. And at 50% off, you get a little bit of a spike, not much. But then, in December, again, this is 2013, so only a couple months after the game released, it's the daily deal for Steam. That is, Steam highlighted the game as, hey, look, here's a game, it's on sale. That's a huge amount of advertising. And so when mm -hmm. Steam comes to someone and says, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to make you make less money per sale on this game, but we're going to give you tons of free advertising, a lot of independent companies happily say yes. And in this case, so again, remember, about $10,500 in sales on the initial release. When it was 33% off. At 33% off. At 66% off. So mathematically half the price. On the daily deal, they sold $23,500. So they made more than double the money charging half the price, 
largely because of the free advertising, um, that drew a lot of attention to the game. Then it was on sale for 66% off. They still had sales. After the 66% off sale ended, sales dropped off. And you're seeing this in a lot of digital marketplaces. So you're seeing a lot of mm-hmm. games go on sale on Switch, for example, because Switch, frankly, yep. the Switch, the, the Nintendo eShop for Switch basically doesn't have really good organization at all. It's kind of almost a free-for-all. And so the, the only way to draw attention is, after your release window, is to go on sale. That's that's how you end up at the top of a search list is to go on sale. Well, and, there's even in the in eShop they have a special here are the deals right now yeah, that you exactly. have to go click on. Right. And and the only way to but that's what I mean, the only way to end up near a top of a list where people are likely to see you within the eShop itself is through going on sale after release because they don't just randomly like, "Oh yeah, here's a 3-year-old game at full price. Why don't you buy this?" They don't do that. So part of it is, one, it improves the visibility. Two, there's also a certain, um, the, the, you know, there's, there's the human brain of, well, if it's only $5, I can't afford not to buy it now, even if you don't end up playing it, which is the story of why I have like 300 games on Steam. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I, I, I guess we should tell people, for folks that don't even know what the summer sale for Steam and the winter sale is for Steam. Just imagine effectively doorbuster prices for Black Friday taken to the nth degree and yeah. it lasts a week and you don't have to stand in line. You just have to sit at your computer and just yeah. buy th- buy games you won't play. Yeah. And, and so the companies very often agree to these significant price drops because it makes them more money in the long run. Uh, also, especially with the emphasis on things like admittedly not a big fan of this, but microtransactions, generally with live service games, you need multiplayer elements. Well, if you want your game to have, if you have a big selling point of your game is the multiplayer environment, such as, you know, say a Call of Duty or um, to a lesser Overwatch. extent, Grand Theft Auto, Overwatch is a big one. You put it on sale because you need uh, not just any players coming into the game, you need new players coming into the game. Because every game of there's some number of people who pl- who will play Overwatch today, and that will be the last time they play it. Not because they're dying, but because they're just getting <laughs> bored of it and they get tired of it. And some small number will not play today, and they need to bring in new players. Otherwise, the game ends up with a very small and also very uh, good at the game population. And once you end up with that, it's actually harder to get new players into the game because they'll join a multiplayer and everyone who's left over will destroy them. Uh, So you want a fresh influx of new players all the time. This is the story of why Heroes of the Storm is dying. Anyway, that's that's the swan song for my my little game. <laughs> so this entire conversation was just so we could come back and talk about how you, one of your favorite games is dying. Oh my gosh, is dying. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oh gracious! Right. Well, you know what? I have another question okay. that I that we're going to go back into more just kind of website techie sort of stuff for a minute here. This is from No Stupid Questions subreddit, who which has just been a gold mine mm-hmm. for us. I've just been very pleased. The question is: Is it a requirement or something for recipe websites to have the entire life story of the creator before the actual recipe is on the page? So this was actually the question that I had already picked for the second question. Did you really? <laughs> yes. Well, then you, because I love well, you this know, question. But anyway, I, I have another one. All right, I will well, anyway well, shortly. Well, so, 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 well, hang on. You know, I'm looking at our timestamp right yeah, here. Actually, yeah, actually, we're already at 34 minutes. We also kind of had a, a bonus question already. So, you yeah, know, right, fair enough. This might be this might be. Well, I don't know. we'll see where we go. So it was bound to happen, right, yeah. that we were going to oh, pick yeah, the same course. question one day. It was bound to happen. So um, I, how much cooking do you do? I'm curious. So I uh, one of the one of the big advantages with um, I, I found with with having a, a girlfriend that became a wife is that I actually cooked a lot more because it's really hard to cook for one because you end up with tons of leftovers yeah. and you don't want to eat them because you just ate it. Uh, whereas oh, yeah, cooking and for two, that a for, lot easier. Yeah. 
Um, well, yeah, portioning for cooking for one person is just hard. It's you know, no. here, here's your here's your meal kit. I'll take out one. Yeah. tiny half cup of rice yeah. and put it in my rice cooker. It looks so sad. Yeah, you cook cooking tacos for one. You need a quarter pound of beef, two flour tortillas, <laughs> three cloves of garlic, and one thirty pack of beer. That's that's what you as a bachelor <laughs> need to have taco night. Anyway. Um, anyway. So I actually do heavily relate to this question because... Oh, it I, spoke to me too. I pull my phone out in the kitchen because yep. I want, I you know... I make my ingredient list and that's fine, but then I'm actually in the kitchen and I'm dealing with the time pressures of, you know, the, the stove, the, the water is now boiling. What do I do? Uh, the oven has, has reached its time limit. What do I do now? And I have to scroll down this life story about how <laughs> someone's mother, like, learned this recipe while helping soldiers in Vietnam uh by treating all their injuries and one of them in in just a fit of grace taught taught her this recipe and now she has passed it on to you and it's, it's can, like i don't uh, how mu how much sugar do i need this can, this this guy's leg getting blown off does not help me know if i need three or four tablespoons of sugar i i know you read down this far in the post but mm -hmm. i have to share this with folks that there was an example given, and of course it's a parody example, but here's kind of what you're seeing. Nothing is better than a grilled cheese on a cold, wintry night. The delightful burst of aroma when the buttered bread hits the pan, the sound of the butter sizzling, and last but not least, the scent of hot tomato soup wafting through the house, while the sound of pine trees rustled from the cold north wind blowing <laughs> restlessly just outside your kitchen window. But don't fret, this grilled cheese and tomato soup recipe will wash away those winter blues in no time flat. And the best part, nearly every household has the ingredients available within reach. So no rushing through to the store frantically trying to find exotic ingredients uh, that you could find on a small wrinkled piece of stationery paper. No waiting in line at the register while the clerk methodically <laughs> scans every item of the customers ahead of you. Simply open the cupboard, open the fridge, and begin. How cool is that? And before I mention this next essential ingredient on the list, let me tell you about the summer spent at my grandparents' house at that old <laughs> ranch-style farm. <laughs> yeah, and there, by the way, he skipped, like, two really big paragraphs, one of which references ancient Mesopotamia. And, and, and of course, that's a joke, but the thing is, um, the, the websites really this are like that. And you e even... You know, to so much so that you can't like I I honestly will leave a website after a bit, but it's to the point I can't find recipe websites that don't have these giant spiels, and I have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. Why is the recipe at the bottom, Sheriff? Tell me, good lord, why? Okay, we are going to talk about that, yeah. but I will just say pro tip up front: if you have, I think this is on iOS and on Android. I know it's on iOS, but the website all recipes does have a dedicated iOS app and it does not have the life stories in them. Okay. So if you use the all recipes app, you do get to skip some of this, but when you're going to delish.com, I think that's one I always seem mm -hmm. to run into that has this, um, they do put the recipe at the bottom and it is all about that SEO search. Oh my God. I said it back. <laughs> SEO. <laughs> S O E S E O. I did say it right. Oh yeah. my gosh. You, you just said it right. I, yes. Search, search I, engine I optimization, right. not search, search optimization engine. engine. Well, I'm an optimization engine in getting things uh, yeah. messed up. So. so you just anticipated that you got it wrong. Anyway, I um, anticipated yeah. I got it wrong. Look, I, the, the idea is if you're just posting a bulleted list of text, you are probably not going to be ranking very highly on Google, DuckDuckGo, whatever search engine you mm -hmm. have, Bing, if you still are binging out there, yeah. um, it's just not enough. Yeah. Now, the original Google algorithm for determining whether a website was considered, quote unquote, important or good or, or would rank highly in your search results was called the page rank algorithm. Yeah. And they still use this algorithm as... Uh, is it's not as important as it was. They've added right. a bunch of other aspects to it. But originally the idea was you would have um, a page would be ranked higher. If more 
important pages linked to it right. and if it linked back to them. And actually, it was a problem for a long time with website, um, with webmasters selling links back and right. forth. So, yeah. oh, I've got, I've got a high page rank. Let me sell back and forth. Well, more things have been added, mm -hmm. such as how much time do people spend on the page? Yep. <laughs> That's part of it. So it is, it will behoove you to hide things to improve your SEO because you, your, your surfers are having to go through the page and also probably you're loading more ads. So there's also yep. a monetary that's, aspect to that's it. That's the big part of it. Yeah. There's a, there's a, that, that story you gave the, the reply to it has an ad after every sentence. And it's just, it's just mocking. Cause that's what it actually is. You're scrolling past the ads and a lot of the websites won't load the page below it now until the ad loads to force you to see the ad. And that, that in particular is, is one of the frustrating things about the internet. But go ahead. Oh, 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 I my, my egregious one is when it loads part of the article and then it says one of 10 and it makes you click to, to, yeah, to page slideshow, over yeah. to get. <sighs> yeah. I don't think anyone ever likes slideshows, but it's a way to artificially inflate clicks. Yeah. Rant time. Um, this is part of where the internet's current financial model is. I think nothing that anyone would intentionally design, but it's what we ended up with <laughs> through a bunch of unintentional decisions. This is why, for example, we have clickbait headlines because how do you make money? Selling ads. You have to have people see and possibly interact with the ads. So you need people to click on your article. And then when you click on the article, you want to show them as many ads as they will tolerate. I mean, that, that is actually true. Not as many ads as they want, as many ads as will not make them mentally say, I am never going to that website again for any reason. Anything short of that, and you're, you have the right amount of ads. You could maybe even fit in some more. And so this model also it just completely destroys any sense of online privacy because a lot of these websites use Google AdSense. Mm -hmm. And so Google has a profile it's collecting about you. And it's like, oh, will you like Mesopotamian grilled cheese and tomato soup? <laughs> All right, well, let me write this down. Let me show you ads for this in the future. And the worst is when I'm, I'm on a cooking website. I've clearly made an intent to cook something and it will start showing me, like, ads for, like, Grubhub for restaurants that are selling the thing that I'm trying to make. That happens. <laughs> because I'll give up on the first, like, three websites because they just it's just too painful to use. And by the time I get to the fourth, Google's like, huh, well, he must like chicken parmesan. <laughs> and so it's just like, hey, you, you can just buy it. You know, you don't have to do all this, all this cooking stuff. Just buy it. It's right here. <laughs> This guy has obviously failed at making chicken parmesan. We better <laughs> toss him a lifeline. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, this model is it's invasive. It encourages bad behavior from content producers. Uh, emphasis on things like outrage. Emphasis on having things people don't want, like these giant stories when I just want the freaking recipe, right? And 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 this model is not seemingly going anywhere anytime soon yeah yeah probably not yeah because because well, we all I, wanted the internet to be free so you know that's right all right i think we do actually have to end with a yep. silly one do you have a silly one queued up because i have one i don't if you need go it. ahead you, you you take it away I'll, I'll do i'll do three next week from the world building stack exchange, Will McBurney, how would a group of elemental mages defend against the guns and artillery of late World War One? All right, so this is actually where it gets interesting. Um, there, no, no, hang on. So there's there's a, there's a really good podcast um, by oh, I'm blanking on it. It's uh, it's a history podcast. They did a special on World War One. I am actually just drawing a hardcore, hardcore history. I was about to say I'm drawing a hardcore blank, and that reminded me. Oh, gosh. Hardcore history. Uh, they did a great podcast on World War I. It's like, it's like five four-hour episodes, so it's amazing. Um, anyway, one of the interesting things about World War I was it was really the first war where artillery just 
completely changed the way war was done. It used to be how did you how did you counteract artillery? You you just built stronger walls, right? If your wall is strong enough, you'll survive the artillery. World War One, no, nothing could survive the artillery that came out. Belgium tried, and that's what and and they just got marched over. So now you're telling me how elemental mages will do it. All right, the short version is step one: do not be between Germany and France. That that's the <laughs> most important step. If you find yourself between Germany that's and France, that's the most France, important element. If you find yourself between Germany and France, run south to Switzerland as fast as possible. You'll be safe there. And if you're worried about getting cold, you have a fire mage. He can, you know, keep you warm at night. Like, there you go. All right. Problem solved. Um, but step two, uh, there really isn't. I don't know how you would survive a World War I artillery because... It was, you were launching projectiles miles away. You wouldn't, that was like the first war where you wouldn't see the cannon and it would kill you. You wouldn't uh, hear the cannon. It would kill you. Congratulations. Uh, the the majority of the posts here concur with you. <laughs> yeah. That a group of, I mean, there are some things like, well, maybe you could try to make a dirt wall you could move as you're walking forward but the range of elemental mages in this particular world was so low according to the person who's de designing this world that you're right they basically had no shot it was a fact i had no shot uh th they would just get mowed over now can one of them the summon reason hurricane force winds going in the direction of the cannonball to slow it down dramatically is that possible? Because then it could just land short of you. There it is. You need a wind mage. You need a wind mage who can summon a hurricane. <laughs> and the, But this is exactly the reason I wanted to bring up this question, because I think it, it's super interesting, is the notion of world building and creating magic systems and mm -hmm. creating fictional systems to, to provide a way for the reader to suspend disbelief mm -hmm and buy into the rules of the world to enter the magic circle as, as game right. designers would say, so that you could uh, be in this kind of joint area of storytelling. And I'm a very large fan of uh, Brandon Sanderson and mm -hmm. the Stormlight Archives and um, Warbreaker and Mistborn and all these, these worlds that have been created with these incredibly interesting magic systems yes yeah. uh malazan where... book of the fallen is another one that i love that i've 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 sung the praises of many times exactly yeah that was the one that that, that, that i was thinking of for you mm -hmm. when, when when i saw this question as well and for those people who are going out there who want to tell stories who want to write games um you know coming up with a a solid set of world building ideas mm -hmm. you know it's taking a little nugget and just building around it um, one exercise we do in the game design class is you say, what would happen if there actually was a ring of invisibility, period? Mm -hmm. if, if anyone could purchase a ring of invisibility, how would that change the actual world? So there were things like, well, we would no longer have windows on first floors right, because yeah. anyone could be walking by and looking in. Uh, we would be changing the way that we would identify people, how mm -hmm. we would know people. It would it, it, it would literally change interactions in the world in mm -hmm. just so many different ways. And so looking at this question here about elemental mages of World War One artillery, you know, you could read this and think, oh, that's, I mean, it's kind of funny because yeah. I, I think about just like, you know, ah, fireball. And it's like, well, here's a cannon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you summoned my trap card. Howitzer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it's, it's so interesting to think of these worlds and to come up with this. So anyway, one I just of, wanted to toss One of my favorite examples of that is, is Mass Effect. So in Mass Effect, oh, yeah. they, 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 they create this idea called the Mass Effect. That's what the, mm -hmm. the name entails, where basically objects can approach zero mass in order to travel faster than light speeds. Um, mm -hmm. And then they're like, well, okay, the combat has guns. And it has tech powers, but we need some third thing, because there's always got to be three things. So they came up with biotics, and the idea is you're a psychic that can manipulate gravity. What it actually means is that you can basically be a Jedi, in terms of you can throw things, you can lift things up, and, and, and you have all these quote-unquote magic powers that are justified in the game as being based around the same technology that enables fast and light travel, effectively the manipulation of, of gravitational fields. 
Um, mm. And it works pretty well. I mean, from from a gameplay standpoint, and from a from a universe building standpoint. So that's uh, that's also a fun little nugget to throw in there. So I hope that. Uh, folks listening, if you if you have an idea over the summer and you are thinking of a story to put together, you know, think about think about how these things interact. And yeah, there you go. And that will do it for the fifth episode. Uh, did you get me anything? Five year, five mm-hmm. episode anniversary? Is it? It's like the uh, it, paper it's, uh, paper it's cut the anniversary. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a peppermint patty. Oh, ooh, yeah, it's a peppermint, peppermint patty peppermint. anniversary. Ooh, well, hopefully it doesn't melt on the way here. I so, mean, it's pretty hot uh, out. I think it's going to melt. Yeah, it's probably going to melt. So, uh, folks, thank you so much for listening. It is great having you join us for this fifth episode of Regrade Request. If you have a question that you would like for us to talk about on the show, please go to regraderequest.com and you can click the button there to leave us a message or you can use the Anchor FM app on ios or android to do that as well if you have not yet subscribed please do so on the podcast service of your choice you can find links to all of those at regraderequest.com you can also find the audio in video form on my youtube channel Um, just google for that and you'll certainly be able to find it my twitter is at mark sheriff will is at prof mcburney and as always watch for falling goats watch for falling goats take care what uh, yeah they have zero the mass of the zero mass yeah zero zero mass goats therefore they can move faster than light so you actually can't watch with